Hey everyone, welcome back to another video and uh, can you guess what we're talking about today? Look, if you can't tell, I love Barbie. I always have, always will. This is just a portion of my Barbie collection that I have here in my house as a 30 year old woman. <laughs> I still have quite a few old Barbie dolls at my parents' house, uh, collectible editions and just ones I love to play with as a kid. I've spoken quite a lot about my love of Barbie in the last, whatever, six years since I've been making videos. Uh, check out this clip, which I think was one of the first times I ever spoke about Barbie on my channel. It's from like five or six years ago. It's when I was responding to um, a book by Michael and Debbie Pearl where they dared to critique my girl Barbie. How could they? The other day at our house, a three-year-old girl was playing with dolls. Let me interject. All children's dolls should be baby dolls, not Barbie dolls. The fantasy arising from playing with baby dolls causes the child to role-play mother. The fantasy arriving from Barbie dolls causes the child to role-play a sex goddess. Damn! Sorry that some girls want toys that give them more aspirations than just being a mother. Like, I was never really into baby dolls when I was a kid, but I loved my Barbie dolls. I loved, loved, loved Barbie. Like, they were my favourite things. Like, my parents would save up and buy me, like, collector's edition of dolls. Like, I had this gorgeous masquerade ball Barbie in this, like, fuchsia silk and black velvet dress, her hair up in curls, and she was beautiful, and I loved her so much. I had an ice skating Barbie, I had a vet Barbie with a veterinary clinic, I had a dog walker Barbie, I had all these different Barbies, and like some of my favourite memories are going to Barnsley Market on a Saturday morning with my mum and picking up secondhand Barbie dolls in all these cool eclectic outfits from the stalls there. It was Oh, it was amazing. I used to get the Barbie books where Barbie would um, have all these different jobs or she'd travel around the world or she'd solve mysteries. And I had this Barbie magazine that's got something like around the world with Barbie and every week or every month or whatever it was, she'd go to a different country and you'd learn all about that country and there'd be stories about the country, there'd be the history of the country and you'd get an outfit that was like typical of that country's culture. It was amazing. My point is, it was amazing. I got so much out of Barbie. There was no pretending to be a sex goddess. <sighs> but Barbie gave me something to aspire to. Barbie taught me that I could grow up to do whatever I wanted with my life. I didn't have to just be someone's mum. Barbie taught me I could have dreams. Barbie, you know, sparked my lifelong love of clothes and fashion and playing with outfits and being daring and just dressing however made me feel good. Screw these two people for thinking girls should only be mothers. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be a parent and there's nothing wrong with wanting to have an awesome career, there's nothing wrong with wanting to have hobbies, there's nothing wrong with loving fashion and pretty dresses or not pretty dresses if that's what you're into. And that's the great thing about Barbie is that she gives young girls so many different things to aspire to and now they're doing like kind of different size Barbies and some who have like you know different body types and different things like that. Anyway, my point is, screw this guy who's like, girls should only play with baby dolls. Screw him. Barbie is an absolute legend. I love her and this is a hill I will die on. Now, everyone has been talking about Barbie recently and for good reason. The Barbie film, it has been long awaited. And honestly, it's the first time in years I've actively wanted to go to the cinema and been excited about going. I've been like, Kieran, we're going. This is non-negotiable. I'm taking you. It's date night. <laughs> Honestly, I absolutely loved it so much. My partner also loved it. He was giggling along with me. Uh, we went to the pub afterwards and we had a really great chat about it. And it was just really, really fun. We had a wonderful night. I honestly couldn't have really asked for a better film. It hit all those nostalgia points, especially in the opening moments. I was like whispering to Kira and be like, oh my God, that was the first Barbie. Oh my God, that was such and such a Barbie. Oh, I had that doll. That one I found on Barnsley Market and we picked it up for like 50p and like, all that sort of thing. It was great. It was funny. The plot was fantastic. I loved the characters. I loved the casting. And as a woman, it was so damn relatable. I thought it was a fantastic film. Sadly, you may have also noticed it is a little bit of a trend amongst mostly fundies at the minute to pay to go and see the film, get all dressed up in pink, and then complain about it. Now, Bethany from Girl Defined has recently released a video about her thoughts, and I haven't seen the whole thing, but the clips I have seen of her and Dave are just 
awkward as hell. Like I like to call it shiny, happy people. What? If you think about it, just think about it for a little bit. And so basically Barbie has to figure out who she is going to be and develop that solid sense of self. And in good existentialist fashion, basically she's going to look inside and decide who she wants to be. So I actually think that whole line that I've just outlined was as actually great in a lot of ways. That is a lot of us are suffering from our own weakness, a reflected sense of self. It's what this person thinks about me. It's my expectations. It's my performance that really gets me to have a sense of self. And so uh, going deeper than that is important. I mean, it's interesting because I was telling you like, um, I watched the Selena Gomez documentary and it basically ends with her being like, you know, I am enough. And it's kind of what the Barbie movie ends with. It's just like the very popular thing to say or to believe um, is to just like, I mean, Ken literally wears like a sweater at the end that says he's enough, but then with the big K. So he's kind of, you know, like Ken, Ken, Ken enough. Um, and Barbie is setting out to be kind of like ordinary Barbie, just like a normal person in the world, just like enough as who she is. She doesn't have to be stereotypical Barbie. She doesn't have to always look perfect. She can get cellulite. She can have flat feet. Um, and she is enough. And so to me, it's really sad that that's where we end things. Like we basically are telling people like that, that's the ultimate end goal. Like you are enough, but like, I just like, what is that rooted in? Just like believing it, just hoping like I am enough, you know, I don't know. Um, as a Christian to me, that's like, like Ali Bastaki has a book, you're not enough. And that's okay because, um, Christ is enough and we find our sense of identity and self in him. Um, and so to me, that's so crucial as a Christian because, I'll never be good enough. But I'm going to be real with you guys. I have had far too much Bethany Beale in my life recently. I am not going to be watching that video in full. I'm not going to be responding to it because I just do not have the brain capacity at the moment. (laughs) You've probably seen in the last two months, I've made two massive deep dive videos on Bethany and Girl Defined. Hey, Coops. You have a little sniffle. And also just last week, I edited Elise's video reviewing the Girl Defined book, which is something I've also done on my channel. Uh, But her video, absolutely fantastic, brilliant, loved it. So honestly, I cannot take any more of her at the minute, so I'm not responding to that. Instead, today we are going to be looking at the response from two of the fundies who I've spoken about on my channel before, Paul and Morgan. You know how I feel about them. (laughs) So today I want to respond to that video in full, give you a little bit of a lesson about the history of Barbie, talk about the petty things in Paul and Morgan's video, talk about the big problems with it, and also give you a little bit of background on feminist theory and why I think Barbie is a feminist icon. I know I'm perhaps a little bit late making this video uh, compared to some people and in terms of like when they put their responses out and stuff, I spent the last week stuck in bed with a flu so yeah this is the first chance I've had to film. (laughs) So as a brief introduction in case you don't know, who are Paul and Morgan? Well, They are a married couple who make tons of videos about Christianity and their fundy lifestyle and they are honestly incredibly miserable. As shown, oh my god, there's a whole compilation of clips I could show here. Morgan throwing up on their wedding day, uncomfortable admissions about their sex life, their on-camera arguments that they publish to their YouTube channel, their general contempt for each other. There have been times when I've done something or said something to Morgan that's been so hurtful and in the back of my mind I'm like, it's nice knowing, it's nice knowing that she can't go anywhere. (laughs) Okay, that doesn't give you the right to say mean things to your wife. I feel guilty about it. The first thing I knew about, uh, I wish I had known about sex, was this. Okay. Don't expect your sex, once you get married... To don't expect the, the sexiness and the adventuresome, crazy, awesome stuff to go from zero to 100 right out of the gate. Realize that is going to take some time. And if I had realized that before getting married, I wouldn't have brought out the whipped cream on, on our honeymoon. It was a bad idea. It made Morgan cry. But in all reality, in my mind, it was, I'm finally married. Now I welcome everything in the kitchen sink 
into our sex life. <laughs> Let's go wild. And Morgan's like, I'm like, bro, I barely know you. <laughs> there are times when either Paul and I are maybe even making a video or talking to one another or another couple. And like, we're like, oh, our sex, how's our sex life doing? And I'm like, it's great. And Paul's like, well, it's good. But, and I'm like, wait, what? I thought we were good. I thought we were on the same page. <laughs> when you so. think you've communicated enough, communicate more. Yes. So that really is just huge, 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 you guys. Uh, you don't wake up every morning. Oh, kitty, kitty. No. Okay. I wish we did. And you don't fall asleep all cuddly you with it. No. I wish we did. I'd like to go to bed snuggling. We uh, do. Okay, no, 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 we're not putting this in the video. We need to work on this. Alright, I hear what you're saying. Let's move on to something else. <sighs> you just act like I never give you any of here. <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. We need to move on. It's fine. We did not literally find any hope or closure to that little scenario. Morgan has had to step up probably beyond her comfort level in a lot of ways because she knows that's what I want and I've had to lower my standards. How to tell your partner you just don't feel like having sex that night. If I feel like he is like needing it, <laughs> then I get myself in the game. I uh, <laughs> assume sometimes Morgan annoys Paul with her lovely weirdness. One time he literally said, okay, no, we Morgan, don't need I need you to stop laughing. <laughs> Well, and I was like, <laughs> um, I assume that Paul can't emotionally connect. Honestly, you're not totally wrong. Okay, when we first got married, it was hard for Paul to connect with me emotionally sometimes or to like mm -hmm. have emotion. You'll also see they're massive hypocrites in terms of how they often shame other women when it comes to how they dress, modesty, tattoos, makeup, all of it. What is going on? with women's attire at the gym. I'm just shocked. There was literally a girl, don't get me wrong, her body was incredible, and that's probably why she's wearing this, because she wants to show it off, um, but she was literally in a, like a, not even a bra, and shorts that were underwear. Like she basically was just in her bra and underwear at the gym, surrounded by men. I do not get it. What is going through people's minds? Why are we dressing like this? Despite the fact that Morgan herself, herself also has tattoos and repeatedly posts photos and videos of herself in tight fitting, slightly skimpy clothing. She's posted photos and videos of herself in bikinis, yet she goes on to lecture the women about being whores and harlots and blah, blah, blah. You get the idea. And the kicker, of course, is that they are homophobic, transphobic, and racist. Yes, all three, they got the bingo. There's an infamous rant from Paul about how he couldn't enjoy the Rings of Power TV series because it had just too many interracial couples. It was really pathetic. Morgan has unhinged rants about non-binary people and so, so much more. Warning, coming up, they get incredibly misogynistic and transphobic in this video. Uh, so much. I just feel like we are seeing more and more and more. I mean, it's, it's so common now to literally see the pronouns of a person in their bio, their Instagram feed. Oh yeah. He, him, she, her, whatever. They, them. You can't be a they, them people. You can't, I'm sorry. Pick one or the other at least. PG, so it's advertised as a kid's movie to kids, teenagers, whatever, adults, but kids, kids movie. Yeah. Suddenly they're throwing in and normalizing this man as the godmother who comes down in his sparkly dress and sequins. He didn't call himself fairy godfather. He called himself fairy godmother. He's still fairy godmother. Just continuing with this overall mainstream culture, political Hollywood push to normalize cross-dressing and gender fluidity. So the fairy godmother is this 
man mm -hmm. coming down in a dress. There is an agenda and there is this strange, heavy handed thing in so many movies and shows now of like, oh. we are going to normalize this. We yep. don't care what you people think. We will make it normal. Guys, please don't ever let it become normal. Please don't ever let this become normal in your household. This is not normal. Together. This is like foreshadowing what movies are gonna look like from now on. I would probably never watch a movie again. If it's so in your face, woke, so in your face, immoral, so in your face, just stupid. But then comes the racial stuff. Yes, I did feel like uh, you quickly see like uh, a black dwo a black uh, elf in the new Rings of Power series. And then you see like uh, several interracial couples. And I'm fine with that. Like, you know what? Unless it feels just ridiculously pushed on us, mm -hmm. I'm fine with that. But I feel like there is a lot of people that are just over the wokeness. Mm -hmm. They are over the wokeness being force-fed to us and Netflix shows and all of these new shows. And so they're kind of like already on edge. And so they go into this show and then they see, okay, well, there's an interracial couple from the, I don't know what the official name was, but they're ultimately like hobbits. Mm -hmm fine oh and then there's another interracial couple fine and then there's another interracial couple and it's kind of like okay it's getting a little exhausting the interracial uh what was it dwarf couple and it's like it's it's starting to feel a little excessive and i'm not saying that in in any way racist it's just like how many are you gonna put like i don't care at all but i could see where some of the pushback maybe is coming from Right, they're obviously doing it on purpose. Practical conversation about women's rights. Women's rights are humans' rights. Is it not fair to ask or to bring up someone saying, let's go back to slavery. And I know like, oh, don't, don't make comparisons. I'm just asking, okay? Morgan, tell me if I'm crazy. <laughs> okay. Could we not have said that about slave owners? Could we not have said, as she said, it's a practical conversation about women's rights. Could we not have said, hey, no, slavery is actually stop the people that are against slavery cut that out this is about slave owners rights they have farms they have plantations to take care of and if we suddenly abolish slavery think about them their lives are going to be greatly mm -hmm. they're going to be in in distress to keep up with the demands yeah. is that not fair it's going to be a big inconvenience to their lives and to their life goals because there are a lot of these young plantation owners that have big dreams and big goals. Mm -hmm. And you're going to strip their slaves away? Am I not allowed to say this stuff? Because I think it's relevant. Because mm -hmm. slave owners' rights are humans' rights. Oh. Am I not allowed to say that? What do you guys think? I think that there's definitely overlap there. There, Yeah. It is very interesting. And I see someone in the comments. This is so dis disingenuous, Paul. Hey, I'm not being disingenuous. I think it's an absolutely... I'm, I'm not saying like they're the exact same, obviously, but I think that's a very healthy comparison. So with all this in mind, let's see what they have to say about my bestie. Barbie. That's you girls. Oh, I feel like a child again. I love this. I love it so much. You know, I'm a little cramped in here. There are worse places to be than surrounded by Barbies, right? So they titled this video, Eye Opening Insights, Christians React to the Barbie Movie. And it looks like this was actually a live stream. And just an aside here from all the Barbie stuff, has anyone else noticed a lot of their content has got like lazier recently, like a lot lazier. This last year, maybe two years, they've done a lot of unedited live streams. Morgan especially just seems like she doesn't want to be there. Is that fair? Amen. How'd the I do? End. How did I do? I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> You'll notice that a lot in this video. Again, incredibly awkward. Combine this with the fact that they never actually bothered to research anything they're talking about. They're incredibly hateful. And is it any wonder that their Patreon supporters and views are dropping so rapidly? There's actually worries that they uh, might have to get a real job. Anyway, this video currently sits at 416 likes and 567 dislikes. So uh, that says something, doesn't it? Let's take a watch together. 
What's up, you guys? <clears throat> I'm Paul. I'm Morgan. The Barbie movie is out. It's been out for a little over a week. Morgan and I went and saw it, and we have thoughts. We have thoughts. I already regret making this video. So first up, they complain that because they went on a day when the tickets were discounted and they didn't pre-book in advance, that they didn't get to sit together in the cinema. It was an awful experience, blah, 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 blah. I don't care, that's your problem quit complaining. My experience was lovely. I took Kieran to an everyman cinema to watch it. We snuggled on a sofa on the back row. We shared a bottle of wine. He had himself a vegan burger. I had some little snacks and chips and stuff like that. It was great. We had a wonderful time. Very relaxed, very cozy. Loved it. That's what happens when you plan in advance. Maybe you could try it sometime, Paul and Morgan. Mm. Morgan, I say we dive right in to you and I, we set out to go see this movie. Our theater experience was interesting in and of itself. <laughs> we didn't get to sit by each other. <laughs> the theaters are packed. We Granted, we went for Discount Tuesday at one of our local theaters, but man, like... The, I'm glad we did. You know, let's just say right out of the gate. Wait, you're glad we did what? That we went on Discount Tuesday. Oh, definitely. Well, yes, yes. Um, I thought you were about to say you're glad that we didn't sit next to each oh. other, which would have really hurt. That's <laughs> not what I was saying. <laughs> yeah, I still don't believe these two even like each other at all. How are they married? I feel like this is a very kin shirt to wear. That's true. Honestly, it is. It's very much a kin shirt. And some of you you're might... You're kind of a kin well, in a way. Choose your words, my beautiful, loving wife. Choose your words. Paul... It's a plain black t-shirt. How is that a Ken shirt? How is that a Ken anything? It's, if anything, the opposite of Ken. Ken loves fashion. Barbie loves fashion. The dolls are, you know, a lot about fashion. Where do you think I get my inspiration from? Barbie, of course, is kind of known for being a fashion icon, but so is Ken. Ken dolls have always pushed the boundaries of men's fashion and been absolute icons, and I love them. Pardon you, baby bean, I'm so sorry, Kubi's just had a biscuit. My first ever Barbie dolls were, I can't remember who I got first exactly, but the first ones I ever got, I think I was about, it was 98, so I must have been about five years old, and I got Barbie, Christy, and Ken from the Pearl Beach collection, and while Ken's outfit wasn't quite as iconic as Barbie and Christy's amazing, pearl encrusted bikinis in metallic blue and pink. Ugh, yes, I still want a bikini like that myself. Honestly, his swim trunks were not out of place. He had these gorgeous bright blue swim trunks with like black pearl edging. They were cool. They were really, really cool. And honestly, that's one of his tamest outfits. Ken has always dressed up to match Barbie's energy. He's all about the bright colors, the bold patterns. Ken has fun with his clothes, okay? This line alone from Paul being like, oh, it's quite a Ken shirt. It's a plain black t-shirt. This says to me, you know nothing about Barbie in general. Not to gatekeep Barbie, but with these two, I will. <laughs> we got a little Kooby in the background now, don't we, baby? <laughs> so I say, I say, I, I hope that I'm not sitting next to these Barbie girls and you're sitting next to Ken's. Like, let's just hopefully that won't be the case. Guess what? It wasn't for me. It wasn't for you. We walk into the theater, and those of you who uh, let us know in the comments, have you seen Barbie? Um, but we walk in, and we see a group of girls decked out in glam decked pink. Out. They're wearing the hot pink with the high heels. And, of course, I, I scoff at them. Just kidding. Yeah, right. But I do. I giggle inside. I kin giggle. I give a kin giggle when I see them, and I'm like, wow. So you see a bunch of friends having fun together, and you laugh at them. That's just mean. Why would you even admit to this? Just tell us you're a bully and move on. And again, this isn't Ken behavior. Ken wouldn't do this. Ken has always been the biggest supporter of Barbie and her friends. He wouldn't laugh at random strangers just having fun together. Look, when I was a kid, when I say I was a Barbie fangirl, I mean I was a Barbie fangirl. Um, I had all the Barbie books. There was a set of like 30 books and I had them all. And they were stories about like friendship and adventures. Some were kind of 
Nancy Drew-esque mysteries, which I really, really enjoyed. Some of them were about Barbie having jobs, like being a doctor or an astronaut or a ballerina. They were really cool. Loved them all. Reading them was kind of like living vicariously through Barbie, and it kind of helped me figure out what I maybe wanted to do with my life when I grew up. <laughs> you making your bed, babes? I also used to get the Barbie comics. I had the whole collection of the Discover the World with Barbie magazine, which was amazing and it came with a new outfit every month. Loved it. It was amazing. I still have that entire collection, by the way, at my parents' house. I used to get the Barbie annuals every year. Anyway, I say all this to make a point. The point is, I have read a lot of Barbie stories in my life and Ken is in quite a few of them. Of course he is, he's one of her friends. He's a big character. Not once, has he ever giggled at someone for the way they dress, for having fun, for being themselves? Not once has he ever mocked someone. Not once has he ever seen a group of friends and thought, hmm, let me bully them. That's not who Ken is. Paul, you're a bully. You're nothing like Ken. Grow up. How can this 30 odd year old man be literally sitting here bragging about mocking teenagers in public? Because this is how old these girls were. We'll see in a minute. They were teenagers. He grow up. We, we go sit down to our seats, we see that pack of girls come in and head right towards me. <laughs> yes, I was seated right next to the pack. Right next to him, but I was behind him and watching. Yeah. My um, Teresa eyes were all over them. <laughs> Morgan, if you can't trust your husband to sit next to a stranger in the cinema, there's something wrong with your relationship. <laughs> Morgan, before we really just rip off the band-aid to uh -huh. this thing, uh -huh. before we just, just, just really dive into this movie, um, I do think we should give a very brief, and, and I would be honored okay. if you would allow me. Oh, no. I think we should do a very brief summary of the film. Yeah, brief, you don't go together. <laughs> Anytime he's like, do you want me to give you a brief summary of the movie I watched last night? I'm like, sure. It's never brief. It goes on for like 30-something minutes. <laughs> I absolutely that is so not buckle up. No, that's not gonna be the case today. I just wanna give people an idea. I don't think we should. Oh whatever. Yeah, these two hate each other. This is so uncomfortable to watch, isn't it? Why do they put this stuff on the internet? Right, but anyway, from this point on, spoilers ahead if you haven't seen the film. Let's go to Paul and Morgan for their summary of what the plot of the film is about. In the movie, you got this Barbie living in the Barbie world, everything is perfect and schlag, and then something starts to go a little bit awry with the main character played by Margot Robbie, where she starts experiencing not so perfect. So you like. Yeah, not so perfect things, and it's like an alarming thing because the Barbie world, everything is perfect. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, I'm with Paul so far, but I don't get Morgan's response here. So one of the things when Barbie first starts going wrong and noticing changes and stuff like that is she starts having lots of little things happening to her body that are kind of unusual, you know? Um, her feet become flat, and she starts having like thoughts of death and depression and all sorts of stuff like that. She also starts getting a little bit of cellulite on just one of her legs, you know? And she gets this, she sees it, it's completely, you know, new and she's like, what, what the hell, I'm not used to this. Of course she's shocked and scared by it. And this is a funny moment in the film because it's something that's so normal, but it's something that women have been made to feel afraid of on their own bodies, you know? The media makes it seem like this horrible thing that women should be afraid of and ashamed of and all this sort of thing. Barbie's reaction is over the top, but it's a pretty common reaction that women do have to get in cellulite for the first time. Or it's at least an exaggerated version of how men and the media expect women to act when they see cellulite on themselves, especially celebrities, you know? There's all these crazy standards in place how women shouldn't have cellulite, and if you have it, oh my god, it's shocking, it's disgusting, why do you have that? Barbie's reaction is what men and the media expect the average woman's reaction to be. That's the point of it, that's why it's funny, you know? Because it points out how silly we're all being, how it isn't actually something to be shocked or scared by, it's not something to be upset by, it's completely natural and normal, and most women have it. It's not something that actually makes Barbie any less perfect, but because she and others have had this like message drilled into them that sell you like bad, sell you like shame and that sort of thing. Like it doesn't make her any less perfect, but of course she feels that way because of what she's been taught over and over and over again. 
It's making a statement about how damaging and ridiculous these high standards that society sets for women are. I feel like Morgan maybe didn't get the point of this and this is why she's acting like a petulant child. But that's not new for her, is it? Um, and in the Barbie world, ultimately women completely rule the world. Yes. And so it's paradise. Yes. Because women rule. <laughs> yep, definitely. <laughs> um, she goes on this adventure to make things right. It takes her into the real world of Los Angeles. Um, while she's there, she kind of discovers why things are uh, out of order and with with her as Barbie, mm -hmm. why things are going awry. Um, she comes back to Barbie world. Oh, and by the way, Ken accompanies her to the real world. And while in the real world, Ken actually discovers that the, the patriarchy, that men rule the world, and therefore it's empowering to him. It's something he's never felt in the Barbie world. Mm -hmm. So he takes that back to the Barbie world and mm -hmm. without giving too much away. Yeah, takes over. <laughs> he, he, he takes over. Yeah, so this happens in the plot, but I do feel like he's missing a key important thing that kind of builds up to this plot point, right? So Ken in this world, right from the beginning of the film, already feels unsure of his identity. He defines himself according to Barbie. He feels like he has no purpose unless he's with Barbie. He's nothing without Barbie, you know? He's always around her. He's always pushing for a romantic relationship with her. And she keeps telling him no, and he just keeps pushing and pushing and pushing because that's the only way he knows to define his identity himself. Barbie has her own life and her own stuff going on, you know? She has so many friends, she has hobbies, she has her own home, she hosts parties for her friends. All the other Barbies have important jobs and things going on in their own lives. Ken, however, has none of that, so he spends his time just waiting for Barbie, following her around, and never taking no for an answer. But Barbie still loves Ken as a friend. She's not treating him badly, she's just a little naive and ignorant and unaware of how empty his life actually is. All of this makes him super insecure, and it's why he's so vulnerable to corruption when he comes into our world. He's like, wait, men are in charge here, they have all this stuff going on, I want this too, maybe I need to forcefully take power like they have and I'll be happy. Also, I want a horse. So that's what he does. I actually viewed this as a pretty interesting commentary on things like incel culture, red pill culture, pickup artists, Andrew Tate fanboys, you know, all these kinds of groups, because it's about how you can take even the nicest men, you find his vulnerabilities and insecurities and exploit it. You tie their worth to their sexual and romantic conquests instead of their own personal achievements and how that can be really, really problematic and dangerous. I'm sorry she's so crackly today. You're okay, Fickle. You want some attention, don't you? And it's a little warm for you today, isn't it? I know, but you're doing so well. Here you are. In the actual real world today, you see things like men on incel forums talking about how things like, life would just be better if women wanted them. They'd be happier if women just wanted them. The world would be a better place if women just had to be their slaves and servants and give in to them every time they wanted and have sex with them all the time and blah, blah, blah. And that, minus the actual sex bit, is exactly what Ken makes the Barbies do in this film. He brainwashes them to become subservient to him and tricks them into thinking that's what they really want, that's what they really think. Ken is an insecure man who's not aware of his insecurities and so this turns to anger and resentment and when he uses his like essentially physical power to oppress people he starts living out every incel's fantasy. So I think Paul and Morgan are missing this part of understanding Ken's motivations here. I feel like they didn't really understand the film on more than just a very surface level reading. Does that make a, a, a words? I don't know. Yeah, you know what I'm trying to say. And when Barbie returns to Barbie world, she realizes, oh, Ken has transformed this into this misogynistic men rule and even the other her other fellow feminist Barbies have succumbed to man rule and they have taken on, we're serving the men, which mm -hmm. was a very interesting in its own right. Yes. And then Barbie has to find a way to turn it back into feminist paradise. Well, the other Barbies have been brainwashed 
and she wants to unbrainwash them so they can go back to making their own decisions again and she wants her friend Ken back. That's her goal. Mm. To turn it back into feminist paradise. Is that fair? Amen. How'd the I do? End. How did I do? I don't know. I zoned out. <laughs> That was the most brief summary I've ever given, and you still zone it out. It's not like it went on for a really long See, time. See, this is Am what I, I wrong? this is what I'm working with. I just give the briefest summary I've ever given, and she still zones out. Give me a little credit, people. <sighs> yeah, this is why they shouldn't live stream, and they need to edit. It is so uncomfortable to sit here and watch their marriage problems and have Paul try and like split the audience into her team versus my team and meh, meh, meh. And he always does this thing where he's like, see what I'm dealing with here, people? And he tries to turn it into a joke, but it's not a joke, is it? It, oh, it's just so uncomfortable to watch. But like, he is not the only problem here. It's not just like him being like, see what I'm dealing with, meh, 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 meh. Like how disrespectful is it to zone out when not only your husband, but your colleague is talking, you know? These two work together. It would be rude to do this to anyone you work with, but the fact she's doing this to a person that she supposedly loves and lives with and has a child with is honestly scaring to me. How can you just like zone out and ignore the person you suppose, like, oh, these two. There is no way these two are even like a basic level of respect for each other and it makes me very sad. Okay, do you want to rate it right now? Yeah. I was going to save that for the end, but we can go ahead right now. I don't know. Whatever. What do you get? What do you want to do? I don't care. We need cuz we need to give our official 1 out of 10 rating. I submit to my patriarchy husband, so All right, let's make him wait till the end. <laughs> I hate them both. What are our our positives of the Barbie movie? Uh, no. I want to hear one positive out of you. If you can't give one positive, then it comes across um, like you. Zero? No, <laughs> just kidding. I think Ryan Gosling was hilarious. I've only ever really seen him in like pretty serious movies. So I thought it was very fun to see his comical side come out. Um, Margot Robbie is literally insanely beautiful. So I enjoyed just seeing her be beautiful. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> She's just so such a beautiful woman, and like I like her acting a lot. This was my least fav favorite movie of hers. So I'm guessing that I've ever seen her in. I'm guessing you liked the uh, line when the narrator's voice come out. Yes, because like, at one point Margot is note to filmmaker. <laughs> yeah, Barbie is crying, and she's supposed to look like wow, this is just a real person crying, not as attractive. Yeah, and she was like, note to filmmaker. Don't hire Margot Robbie if you're trying to get this point across. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Something like that. Okay, so you like that part. Yes. Yeah, I'll give her this. She's right here. Ryan Gosling was great in this, and the entire cast was absolutely stunning. I think the casting choices for pretty much every character was perfect. I have no complaints about any of the casting. I really liked all of them. I thought it was great. I do kind of feel like, again, they missed a point with this narrator line, though. Um, so, for context... Barbie is already having this like existential crisis, right, about who she is and where she fits into the world. And then Ken makes this point to her about feeling left out, you know? He says, it's Ken's Mojo Dojo Casa House, not Barbie's Mojo, Mojo Dojo Casa House. <laughs> How did the actors say that so much? Good on them. It's not fun, is it? And she realizes how hard it's been for him to kind of like be in the background and second to her all the time and how you know, she realizes that he doesn't really have a place in the world and now neither does she. So Barbie like turns and walks away and she's feeling all hopeless and she has a cry to Gloria and her kid. That's the human who owns her and her kid. And you know, she cries about how difficult it is for her and how scary it is to be having all these human experiences now, you know? She's got these complicated emotions, she's experiencing change, she no longer has this constantly perfect hair and makeup, she's overwhelmed and she just wants to give up and she has a little breakdown, you know? When she's found by the weird and discontinued Barbie, she says, I'm like you now, ugly. They either brainwash you or you're ugly, there is no in-between. Again, this is a great statement on how super misogynistic cultures treat women. Look at all the incels and MGTOW guys and pick up artist forums and all that sort of thing. If, as a woman, you don't fall in line, they talk about how ugly and stupid and worthless you are and blah blah blah. Even Paul and Morgan actually do this, they're part of this problem too. If you're not their idea of a biblical woman, then you must be ugly and miserable and stupid and worthless and blah 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 blah. We've all heard it before from them. To them, 
there is no middle ground, which is what Barbie's experiencing too. And because Barbie is in such a vulnerable and messed up and emotional state at this point, she starts to believe them. She starts thinking, if I'm not like them, if I'm not their idea of perfect all the time, if I don't have perfect makeup, perfect hair, if I have cellulite, if I cry, if I have emotions, if I don't do what they say, then I must be ugly and worthless. It's how patriarchal power structures have made women feel for decades now and she's finally experiencing it herself and we're seeing it on screen. That's the whole point of this bit of the film, right? So Gloria comes back and Barbie is still crying and they have to show how she's feeling all these infections at this point by not only having her say the line, I'm not pretty anymore and crying, but they also show it visually through her costume and makeup and all that stuff. They have her throw off bits of her outfit, they have her take off her heels and her hip earrings, she's got all these flyaway hairs all over the place, she's not wearing any makeup in the scene, or at least, you know, like minimal film makeup, you know what I mean. Um, and even when Gloria tells her she's beautiful, she replies with, I'm not stereotypical Barbie pretty. And the point isn't meant to be what Morgan thinks, which is like, oh, she's ugly now, so she's crying. That's not what the point's meant to be. The point is meant to be, even if she feels ugly, she's not we can still be beautiful without having all these things that were told make us beautiful in the past. She's been told before that she's pretty because of her perfect makeup, her hair, her matching outfits, her heels. She thinks without all that stuff, she's ugly now. But we can still see, no, she's not. She's gorgeous, she's beautiful. And it reminds the audience that there are so many kinds of beauty and that we all have this natural beauty in us and we don't need to conform to someone else's beauty standards to be beautiful. Beauty is about who we are and how we choose to express that, not how well we fit into what society says we have to look like. Barbie thinks she's not beautiful because she's not stereotypical Barbie beautiful, which is generally thought to be blonde makeup, tiny waist, heels, etc. But we're being told here, there's so much more to beauty than that. That's the point of the scene. And then, then, as an extra added layer, the narrator comes in with a line, Note to filmmakers, Margot Robbie is the wrong person to cast if you want to make this point. And it's hilarious, not because ha ha ha, she's actually pretty and saying she's ugly, which Morgan thinks the point of it was, but because Margot Robbie as a person is actually about as close to stereotypical Barbie pretty as a human can be, you know? She's blonde, traditionally beautiful, tall, skinny, typical Barbie, that sort of thing. So this Narita line is making a point about that and how maybe it would have been more impactful to have like a short brunette who's maybe a bit more curvy be reminded that she's beautiful even though she's not stereotypical Barbie beautiful, you know, instead of a woman who is literally stereotypically Barbie beautiful. But the point still stands, it's great. It's just funny to point out and have this brilliant bit of self-awareness from the filmmakers. Great, loved it, brilliant. Shame Paul and Morgan didn't get that point. Anything um, else? Um, I, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> that's about all I got. <laughs> okay, all right. I agree with you, Ken, particularly bad Ken, if you will, because for the first half of the movie, he's just annoying, cliche, shallow Ken, and then he turns into, uh, this is kind of spoilers, if you will, but you get the picture. He turns into this, you know. <laughs> he's uh, finally being seen for the first time. <laughs> yes, he's being seen. He's macho man. Because Barbie does not love Ken in this movie, just FYI, which BTW in the Barbie movies, Barbie loved Ken, okay? Wait, really? Yes. And Ken was like Prince Charming, you know, like Barbie and the Nutcracker, like all these movies. The Wait, is that a real movie? Was the prim Princess and the N Nutcracker. <laughs> so Princess and the Nutcracker. Now that sounds like Wait, a Wait, Princess and the Frog? Po Poppernickel. <laughs> princess and the Poppernickel, Princess and the Nutcracker. Of, one of y'all out there knows what I'm talking about that movie. But like Ken is in there being another character, but he's like Prince Charming. He comes and saves the day. He is so like, yeah, I just, they really <laughs> made it where she hates him. So again, misinterpretation of Ken right? He doesn't turn into a macho man, he turns into a fake douchebag because he thinks that's what being a man is supposed to be. It's performative. 
He thinks that's what he has to do to find himself and be a man and get the girl and have all the power. But at the end of the day, he realizes that none of it is real. None of it is working. None of it is making him happy. He's still miserable and lonely. And none of this power he now has is real. And as for Morgan's point about the past Barbie films, I, ooh, ooh, the fangirl in me has many things to say about this. <laughs> okay, there are a handful of stories in the history of Barbie. You know, it's a big long history. Uh, the first doll was created in 1959. We have a long history here. Um, there are a handful of stories where Barbie and Ken date or he's her date to something, um, like, you know, to a ball or something like that. There's maybe a few stories here and there where he's called her boyfriend. There were even one or two Barbie and Ken wedding set dolls over the ages, but they weren't the most popular, to be honest. Uh, for the most part though, Barbie has been marketed as Barbie's friend Ken. That is the tagline that he has, you know? Or in some cases, he's been marketed as Barbie's dance partner, Barbie's skating partner, Tommy's big brother, or in most cases, just Ken. Just Ken. Now, in relation to the actual Barbie films, the one that Morgan is trying to reference here is Barbie and the Nutcracker, which was one of my favorite films as a kid, and honestly, it still stands up today. Excellent film, wonderful. Everyone should watch it. I had it on video as a kid and I watched it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. So many times, I loved it. But in that film, Ken is not Barbie's love interest. He's just not. That's not the way the film goes. So for those of you who don't know, Barbie in the Nutcracker. The film opens with Barbie as a ballet teacher trying to teach her little sister Kelly to dance a solo from the Nutcracker which of course is a famous ballet set to the music of Tchaikovsky inspired by a book. <sighs> many, many layers. <laughs> this is a film inspired by ballet, inspired by book. Kelly, I believe, used to be marketed and sold as Chelsea Dolls, but along the way she got a name change, so fun fact for you there. I think I remember having a Chelsea doll. Oh, was, it, was she Kelly? I can't remember. But she was the one who came with a high chair and a little magnetic hand and she would eat. Great. Loved it. I loved the toys with like little mechanisms and stuff. I thought that was so clever. Anyway, so Barbie is trying to teach Kelly how to dance, right? Point is, these are the only Barbie characters in the entire film, in this one scene. Barbie and Kelly. They're, only, they're the only Barbie characters, the only Barbie dolls, the, on, the only Barbies in the film. That's it. The rest of the film is retelling the story of the Nutcracker with characters from the Nutcracker. So Barbie explains the story of the Nutcracker to Kelly in the hopes that one, she'll understand it better and you know, be able to put that emotion stuff into her dance, but also mostly learn from the character of Clara in the story about the importance of being brave and in Kelly's case, help her get over her stage fright, right? So Barbie tells the story of the Nutcracker this is the main part of the film, and in showing this story, Barbie takes on the role of Clara, Kelly takes on the role of some of the dancing kids and little fairies and other stuff like that. Other than that, you just have the characters in the story, you know? And the film ends not with Ken saving the day, but with, and again spoilers, the Nutcracker himself gets injured in a fight with the Mouse King, Barbie cries and kisses him and brings him back to life because true love, and he's brought back to life in his true form of Prince Eric. Clara is then revealed to be the true Sugar Plum Princess. The Sugar Plum Princess and Prince Eric dance together. Mouse King is defeated happily ever after. So if anything, Clara saves the day and there's no Ken. To interpret this film in any way as Ken saves the day and is Barbie's boyfriend is stupid, ill-informed and just plain wrong. <laughs> uh, I thought that, again, going to the positive elements of the film, when we are introduced to patriarchy, bad kin it actually <laughs> breathed a lot of almost and again he was over the top patriarchy he was over the top misogynist if you will mm -hmm. but it brought a breath of like oh i i literally you guys the redditors are gonna be all over for me oh, no. all over me for this but <laughs> no. you almost because it's so women uh, men are the problem, men are bad, women need to be in positions of, of lead, like women literally need to rule the world, that's the best way. It was so pushed th like that, that when Ken suddenly got his shot and kind of took over, I was rooting for him. Yeah, same. Again, way to miss the point of the entire film. Even Ken wasn't really rooting for Ken. He was miserable in his position of power. Like, what the hell is wrong with you, Paul? 
you might watch this film and root for Ken to find happiness and purpose and meaning in his life and learn, but you don't root for him to take everything away from the Barbies, which is what Paul was doing. You don't root for him to brainwash them and take away their bodily autonomy, which is what he was doing in that state. You don't root for him to try and force someone who doesn't want him into a relationship with him, which is what he was doing. You don't root for him to aggressively try and maintain control over everyone, which is what he was doing. His attempt at taking power didn't actually make him happy because he still didn't have a real identity in that and he still wasn't genuinely respected and he was motivated by insecurity and anger and wanting revenge. Of course, nothing he did was actually going to make him happy or fulfilled when he's motivated by that, you know? I actually messaged my partner um, about this and sent him the clip of Paul and was like, as a man, what do you think about this? And he was like, so his response was to sarcastically say, ever since I heard the word Mojo Dojo Casa House, I knew he was the real hero. <laughs> but he laughed and said, no, rooting for him to learn, sure. See, he got the point. You root for Ken to learn and grow and find his identity and figure himself out, you don't root for him to oppress women and take away their bodily autonomy, unless you're a douchebag like Paul. <laughs> and, he, and it was just because he was funny. Like, he actually brought humor, much needed humor that the film lacked. Like, the film, well, we're about to get into the negatives. Were we watching the same film? Like, it was genuinely hilarious, right? I thought the beach scene where the women, like, form their plot, and so they're just kind of like... Oh, yeah. Uh, leading the men on. So they're like, hey, you know, okay, yeah, you can play your guitars and sing for us. And it was like kind of that joke that men want to grab the guitar and think that they're Well, like, I liked Ryan's line. He said, can I grab my guitar and sing at you for four hours? Sing at you. <laughs> and which is kind of funny because in all reality, the person that brings the guitar to the party <laughs> just, wants, just wants to play at you, doesn't really want anyone else to join in. <laughs> like. not, girls maybe don't love that as much as guys think. Good job, guys. Good job. Good job. You got one joke in the film, right? You, you understood it about how men can sometimes be a little self-centered and thoughtless. Good job. Good job. Visuals, people were, were you know, the people that love this film were raving about the visuals. Oh my goodness, the scenery, the costume, hilarious. the design. It's hilarious to me because the whole set was plastic. <laughs> like, don't get me wrong, I enjoyed it to a point, but like, let's be real, the whole set was plastic. It probably cost like a million dollars. Yeah, because the point was to make the sets look like life-size versions of actual Barbie play sets. I just... That was the point, Morgan. Why are you mad about that? I think most of us Barbie fans loved it because we could literally see the Barbies we had growing up on screen, you know? We could see the Barbie dream house that we all dreamed of having. We could see the play sets that we had come to life. It was great. I think the fact that they took actual Barbie dolls and accessories and made life-size versions for the sets was genius, and I'm so happy they did it. It was perfect to me. I don't get why Morgan has a problem with that. Now, the negatives. Let's go, Morgan. I'll let you rip off the Band-Aid. All right. Because there were, there were plenty of negatives. Plenty. All right. <clears throat> well, just correlating to that marketing, the opposite side of it is like, this movie is not good enough that like, if they didn't have a great marketing team, like, people would not have gone to see this movie. Like, it wouldn't have the hype that it has because it's not that great of a movie. Like, it's not a five star or whatever, ten star movie, like. Okay, one, it could be the greatest or worst film in the world, doesn't matter. Of course people aren't going to see it without good marketing. That's the point of marketing, to make people aware of the film and make them want to watch it. And two, you're wrong. I thought it was great. <laughs> I said it before, but like, I genuinely don't know the last time I enjoyed a film that much. I seriously thought it was great and I can't wait to watch it again. And I don't say stuff like that lightly. You know how critical I can be. And I genuinely enjoyed it. I came out of that cinema with my cheeks actually hurting from smiling so much because I enjoyed the film that much. At the end of the day, objectively, even if you pull the intense woke feminist political stuff out of it it's just not that great a movie well if you pull that all out there wouldn't be a storyline anymore because that was the whole story so let us begin guys oh no 
a feminist film made by a feminist filmmaker featuring a predominantly feminist cast about a feminist toy who's a feminist icon was feminist, shocking, and unexpected. If you want, if you're just like, oh, I love the movie, and you, that's fair. You're allowed to have that, but you're wrong. <laughs> it, it just wasn't that great of a movie. It just wasn't that great of a movie. Right, 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 right. Grow up, Paul. That's all I have to say about that. Okay, so here's the thing. I grew up playing with Barbies, with Polly Pockets, even brat stalls, until my mom realized that they were way too sexualized. And you played like, with no. brat stalls? <laughs> Actually, same experience as Morgan here about brats. I think I was a little too old for brats by the time they came out, and I was I was a Barbie girl all the way, you know. Um, but oh god, there's this really awkward bit where Paul judges Morgan for playing playing with brat dolls, and he looks away in disgust, and it's just like, you know, now we can add that to the list of things he resents her for. Like it's not already long enough. I just, what's wrong with these two? I can't imagine what it would be like long term to be with a partner who doesn't support your interests and passions and stuff like that or like you know just enjoy hearing about the things that you've always loved and enjoyed like even as a kid you know I mean like obviously Kieran's not into Barbies himself but he sat there and he listened to me like ranting about how much I loved Barbies as a kid for like an hour in the pub after the film and he was letting me go on and on about like all these Barbies that I had and my experiences playing with them and all these things I used to do it was great and he sat there and listened and asked questions and he cared about what I had to say because he cares about me when I was like oh I'd really like to get some of the the dolls from the film and that sort of thing and I was like which one should I get these are the ones I like he was like and I was like oh are you sure I should do this you know money and he's like it's your money, you've worked hard, if you're going to enjoy them, you go for it, you get them. And he encouraged me and it was so lovely. And it's just like, when I see Paul acting the way he does, it makes me really, really sad. Also, I'm glad I got the dolls, they're gorgeous, aren't they? Oh, I love them so much. Look at this gold jumpsuit, like, oh, I want one of these in real life. Oh, she's stunning. Stunning. And this dress, oh my god. If anyone can find me this dress in real life, I want to wear this as well. I love this so much. Oh, I just think they're so beautiful. These are absolutely stunning dolls though. The like paintwork on the face is gorgeous. The hair is gorgeous. The accessories are gorgeous. The out is, oh, I love them so much. <sighs> they make me so happy. Mm. Sorry, anyway, where were we? It was so political, you guys. So political that that over shadowed everything else in my personal opinion it was shockingly political like shockingly yeah it was so hard to you know enjoy or appreciate the costumes enjoy or appreciate the setting the the cast that was there like you really couldn't here's a theory that i just that have kind of is, has been formulating could it be so in your face political that it was almost intended to be like a satire film like, she was thinking to herself, we're just going to, we're not just have, out to have an agenda that women rule the world and that men are, you know, the problems, all the problems in the world, but we're actually going to make a satire film, like an SNL skit. I don't know. I mean, it was just so <laughs> insane. No, because they were being very serious about their stuff that they were bringing up. So that's my first thing is it's just way too political. I'm fine if you want to bring politics into movies. I'm fine if you want to try to get your agenda across in a movie. But there's a line that you cross to where it's like nothing is fun about this movie anymore because you have gone way too over the top. Every other line is men are trash, women rule, the world must be run by women, men are just crap. So that was not even close to being the point of the film. I just, I cannot. And I mean, there were definitely some political elements in there, sure, but maybe just not the ones you seem to think. I have to ask, how stupid are these two? Well, I said something when we got out of the movies, America Ferrara, Ferrera, whatever her name is, she had like a spiel monologue where she went off about like how hard it is to be a woman and, be skinny, but not too skinny. Smile at a man, but don't smile too much. Do this, do that, blah, blah. And I said something about how, like, I mean, everything she said was basically true. I was like, but does that mean that 
that means women should just totally rule the world? Does that mean that men have it way better than us than women do? Like, no, not necessarily. Okay, first, a little respect for America Ferreira, please. I love her. She's great. Uh, Secondly, again, that wasn't the point of the film, though. It was about finding your identity for yourself and having so many options, being able to figure out who you are and what experiences you want to have, which is also the point of Barbies. It's about self-expression, figuring out who you are, who you could be, who you want to be, you know? Now, sure, the ending of the film had Barbie World going back to pretty much how it was in the beginning, overall, you know, on a kind of societal level, a political level, all that sort of thing, right? It was mostly run by women, and it made a point of saying, Barbie World wouldn't be equal until our real world was equal, because Barbie world is meant to be a reflection of our world, you know, the opposite of our world, right? So the fact that even after everything, even having characters and individual people learning lessons and people growing on all this stuff, even after all that, in Barbie world, by the end of the film, not much changed on a macro level. Nothing really changed in terms of power structures, right? Now, the point of this wasn't saying, see, women should run the world. It was saying, see, Policy changes and politics and power structures changing is difficult and slow and takes a really, really long time. These changes don't happen overnight. It's a reflection of how, even in our real world, despite the fact we have more feminists than ever, and despite the fact that some individual women have more personal freedoms than ever, that doesn't mean we have any real power and influence still when it comes to the power structures. Most of us still live on a worldwide level under patriarchal societies where men are the ones in power. Men are the ones in real positions of influence. The ending of that film in terms of what happens to Barbie world is a statement on how it's hard to enact real long lasting change which benefits minorities without those minorities holding any positions of power themselves. That's what that ending of the film was all about. Was it unfair that the Kens were not fairly represented in the Barbie world government? Yes, absolutely. And that's the point because it's a reflection of how women are treated in our government and positions of power in the real world. If you think what is happening to the Kens is unfair, that's because it's a reflection of what's happening to women in our world and that's unfair. Even though we have a number of women in positions of power and politics today, it's absolutely still not even. And the women in those positions of power are not treated as fairly as men. It is a huge problem. Feminist authors like Marianne Sijar often refer to this as the authority gap, which is something she has written about in her book of the same name. As part of research for this book, she spoke to women all over the world and she writes, the authority gap affects women all over the world, whatever the differences in culture. I've talked to women from Africa, Latin America, Asia, and the Middle East, as well as from Europe and America, and they all say that they have experience of being taken less seriously than men. She literally addresses the exact problem that the Barbie movie shows us is an issue. She writes, spotting our own biases is a start, but it's not the end. We need to address the problem at a structural level too. As long as we see many more men than women in positions of authority, we will tend to associate men with authority and women with subordinate status. As long as we allow boys to grow up believing that they are superior to girls, we are instilling habits of mind that will be very hard to change in later life. As long as we keep women in the workplace down by punishing them for being as assertive or self-promoting as men, they will never advance in the same numbers. And as long as we make work patterns unfriendly for our parents of both genders, we're going to prevent women from reaching the positions of authority that they need to for society to rebalance its stereotypes. This isn't all. She also recounts an insane number of cases of women in positions of power and politics being reduced to no more than their looks, which is something I myself have to experience all the time as a YouTuber. I either get men telling me that I'm not pretty enough for them to listen to and spend any time, you know, paying attention to, Or, at the other end of the spectrum, I get men and women who tell me that I only have any success because of how I look. Because because you're pretty enough that people listen to you. If you weren't pretty, people wouldn't listen to you. Apparently, they tell me that the only appeal of my channel is not my intelligence or the fact that 
I am well educated and went to one of the best universities in the world. It's not because of my extensive career history in digital marketing. It's not because of the sheer amount of time or effort or hard work I put into my videos. It's just because of how I look. Whatever I do as a woman gets reduced down to, okay, but what do you look like? and it's insulting, and it's something that so often male YouTubers don't have to deal with on a regular basis like us women do. And I'm not in the minority here. It happens to women everywhere, doesn't it, Kubi? Yes, yes it does. It's not just on YouTube though, this happens to women in every single field around the world. So Siege House recounts when The Observer wrote a profile on Christine uh, Lagard, I think I'm pronouncing that right, who is the cerebral head of the International Monetary Fund. She is a highly intelligent woman with years of experience and countless qualifications who was now in an incredibly difficult job which requires a lot of skill and hard work and they titled the article about her, Is This the World's Sexiest Woman? And in brackets, and the most powerful? The second paragraph of this article described her appearance before her credentials. It wrote, What lovely teeth she has, straight and white. They gleam out of a permanently, almost alarmingly tanned face. Tall. She's five foot ten. The slim, 55-year-old Lagarde dresses with the, with the casual elan of a Parisian, patriotically attired in Chanel suits and Hermes scarves along with jazzy bracelets and fur-lined ponchos. Apparently that's more important than her education and her work history. As Seashots writes, the single standard of beauty for women dictates that they must go on having clear skin. Every wrinkle, every line, every grey hair is a defeat. This has implications for how seriously women are taken. Girls are taken less seriously than middle-aged women, yet middle-aged women are expected to do all they can to look more like girls. Again, this is an issue I've faced. I know I look quite young for my age, so you get it from both ends of the spectrum. People who try to discredit me now that I am looking older and I'm looking closer to my age and, ugh, are you wrinkles? Ugh, you be getting grey hair soon. Ugh, me, 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 me. Ugh, you have an aged well. And then the other people who are like, oh, you look so young, you're so young, how can I take anything you say seriously? They talk to me like I'm a teenager and not a 30 year old woman. But again, it's not just about beauty and stuff like that. The perception and authority gap is even more of an issue for those of us who come from working class backgrounds, but also for women of colour and trans women as well. Maggie Adderin Pocock is a black British space scientist and she told Marianne Seedshaw of the story of when she was having lunch with a bunch of white male colleagues who, like her, either had their PhDs or were studying for them. They were all on the same level as her and a colleague she didn't know approached her and asked, whose secretary are you? They took one look at her as a black woman and assumed she wasn't on the same level as them. And this was in 2018. This is an ongoing problem for women. One of the problems that the Kens faced at the end of the Barbie film um, was that they weren't part of the Barbie club, they weren't part of the girls club, they were left out. And this is something that women in politics have to deal with today, and it's one which Caroline Lucas, who is a Green MP, has spoken about often. Now, I'm a little bit biased because I love Caroline Lucas. I used to live next door to her son, Theo, and he is a lovely guy, lovely family. He once got drunk and fell in a bush trying to pick me a flower, very sweet. So, they're my biases when it comes to Caroline Lucas. So there's a great quote from her on this where she says, feminism means doing away with the patriarchy and the old boys network that runs right through our society. It means insisting on the right to be heard, free of the abuse, ridicule and prejudice that still tries to silence women's voices. And she is absolutely right. In the UK especially, so many politicians, regardless of their party, Labour, Tory, Lib Dem, whatever, the majority of them are a bunch of rich white kids who all went to Eton together and then gone to Oxford or Cambridge together and it really is this network of friends who are all corrupt and help each other out and it, ugh. Thankfully we're seeing a few more people push through and push back against this, but it's slow progress and it's not enough. It does mean that minorities get silenced because they're not part of this network. Laura Bates, author of Men Who Hate Women, actually points out that it's so much worse than this though. It's not just an old boys club pushing women out and making them feel a bit excluded. She writes about how women in politics are actually in real danger. She writes, in the UK, the overwhelming majority of female MPs have, have received online 
and verbal abuse. And it's the norm to see women who dare to voice their views online excoriated and harassed by mobs into silence. These online norms create a powerful precedent. They suggest that the sheer impertinence of a woman daring to have a political opinion is unendurable, and that the best way to deal with those who get ideas above their station is to silence them and to do so violently. When we see rape and death threats bandied across social media in such extraordinarily high numbers, when we watch and take note of social media companies actively refuse to suspend the accounts of those who send threats, when we receive the message that this behaviour, this discourse, is acceptable. Subsequently, a large number of female MPs have begun to experience real-life abuse, from being screamed at on the street to having their windows smashed. She then discusses the heartbreaking case of Joe Cox, a Labour MP who was murdered. Bates writes that Labour MP Joe Cox was a passionate feminist and humanitarian, speaking out in Parliament about the Syrian refugee crisis, immigration and women's issues, and serving as chair of the Labour Women's Network. In the period leading up to her death, Cox had been targeted with a wave of abusive messages and harassment, causing additional security to be considered at her home and office, and a man to be cautioned for sending her malicious communications. She was, in other words, a victim of trolls months before she was shot and stabbed to death while leaving an advice surgery in her constituency. Normalised misogyny is dangerous. Normalised misogyny leads to the deaths of women. It's not just active abuse that stops female politicians from doing their jobs though. Women who seek power are judged more harshly than men in the same positions. They're taken less seriously, interrupted more, not included in behind the scenes socialising and networking. There's not enough help for politicians who get pregnant or need help with childcare. Again, to quote Marianne Seashaw, as she points out, increasing female representation is only half the battle because it's not much use getting women elected if they're prevented from doing their jobs effectively once they're there, and frequently they are. There are stories of male politicians patronizing women from douchebag and pig lover David Cameron telling uh, Angela Eagle to calm down, dear, to other female politicians from all over the world sharing stories of being shushed by men, having their microphones cut off by men as they're trying to speak in parliament, being questioned whether their contributions are really that important. Uh, one woman told of how she was sexually propositioned by a male colleague who then refused to work properly with her because she turned him down. The Interparliamentary Union's 2016 study found that 66% of all female parliamentarians worldwide had been regularly subjected to misogynistic remarks from their female colleagues, ranging from degrading to threatening. Some examples include, you would be even better in a porn movie, and she needs to be raped so that she knows what foreigners do. These are male politicians talking to their female colleagues who are supposed to be their equals. So honestly, yes. This is still a problem for women in the real world, and the ending of the Barbie film for the Kens being, one day the Kens will have as much power and influence in Barbie land as women have in the real world. <laughs> that still means they have a better deal than we have today. Let's be honest. Sure, the Kens might not have as much political power in Barbie land as some women do in the real world today, but at least the Kens aren't being harassed, threatened, pushed from their jobs and murdered. I don't see how anyone can watch this film and call it man-hating and then claim that women aren't oppressed in the real world. The Kens in this film go through so much less than what women do every day in our real world. If they can see there are issues with the way the Kens are treated, why can't they see that there are issues with the way women are treated? It's like mistreating women, harassing women, degrading women has become so normalised that people can't see it when it's right in front of their faces. Why is it bad when it happens to a fictional man, but not when it's happening to thousands of real women every day? There are a ton of very good men in this world, and I am tired of it being made out to be like the majority of men are just total trash. Leaving leaving this film as a man, you're you're almost like okay. I there you're, there were a few options for you. A man that had just watched this film should feel one guilty for being a man. Two, okay, being a man is so bad that I'm going to become trans, and now now I'm fixed because now I'm a, a woman. Mm -hmm. Or um, kind of like I'm going to be 
the uh, most quiet. The, the, the most meek, submissive, <laughs> soft man now. Oh, for God's sake, there is so much wrong with this. <sighs> How are these two so messed up that they can't even talk about the Barbie movie without being transphobic? First up, there are lots of amazing men in the world. No one is disputing that. No one is saying all men are trash. As for what Paul says, stop it. One, you can't just decide to become trans, that's stupid. Trans women aren't just men who decided to become women, they're women who were born in a body that wasn't right for them. They're still women, they have always been women, it's not a decision they made, it's just who they are. And two, there's another option for the men coming out of this film. You could be like my partner and my other friends who have seen this film and they all came out thinking, oh, that was a fun film, I enjoyed it. They didn't feel personally attacked by it because they know they're not a part of the problem that it was critiquing. They themselves are feminists actively doing what they can to fight those inequalities. So of course they weren't offended by a film which is fighting for the same values that they possess and fight for themselves. If you're a decent person, you're not offended by a film asking men to be decent people, you know? Yeah. I, there was a little redemptive monologue between Ken and Barbie. I, I, a little, you know what I mean? Where it was like, okay, he's Fair. able to kind of yeah. also find his independence uh -huh. apart from Barbie. But, uh, but largely, any man that goes to this film is going to feel guilty walking out. A little monologue? What? Oh. This was like the climax of Ken's storyline in the entire film. This was the main point of his character about Ken finding his identity outside of a relationship and realizing that he shouldn't spend his life chasing after a woman who doesn't want him romantically and only sees as a friend and him learning to enjoy the friendship that they have and appreciate that she loves him just as a friend instead of constantly pushing for more. This is the entire point of Ken's character. It's not a little monologue. It's the peak of everything for him. Ugh. And I can tell you this again, my partner did not feel guilty walking out of that film. He felt happy. We had a great night. Many men come out of the film feeling the same thing. It's not our fault. You're a douchebag, Paul. And it's just very sad to think I had these, you know, 17 year old teeny bopper girls in their pink dresses and high heels sitting next to me. You got these these young ladies that are just ingesting this film. That's what one thing that I wrote down. It very, it's very sad and sobering. So this is what I was alluding to at the beginning. Morgan was getting jealous of 17 year old kids sitting next to her husband. If you have to worry about your 30 odd year old grown adult husband being around teenage girls, there's something wrong with the pair of you. Yeah, I was looking around at the end of the movie of just like all the people leaving and as we were walking out, just young girls, like there were some as young as probably five or six in there, which Wait, for is real? weird, yeah. Because there was some sexual innuendo, yeah, some definitely. some sexual innuendo yeah, this in this movie's film. not meant for kids, which is also sad because it's Barbie. Uh, it's never really been marketed as a kid's film, has it? But I also think the sexual innuendos in the film are the ones that are going to go over kids' heads so if a kid does happen to watch the film. So it's not really a bad thing. Like, I made this comparison in one of my Colleen Ballinger book reviews where, for her, writing a book that gets published by Simon & Schuster Children's, which features lots of jokes about your uncle raping you, is not funny or appropriate. But on the other hand, having a film for kids like Wallace and Gromit make a joke where Wallace is stuck wearing a cardboard box that says may contain nuts, that's a funny joke that's kind of in there for the adults and it's gonna go over kids' heads and but the adults can have a giggle while watching it with their kids, you know? And I thought it was the same in this film. It's not a kid's film, but a lot of it is very kind of appropriate for teenagers, older kids, that sort of thing. But there are a few more adult jokes in there that are likely to go over younger kids' heads. They're not inappropriate, they're just there for the adults to have a giggle at, you know? These sexual innuendos were things like, <laughs> there's a joke like after Barbie's party where Ken says, can I stay over tonight? And Barbie's like, to do what? And Ken's like, well, I don't actually know. <laughs> <laughs> which is quite funny. And then there's another right at the beginning where um, Ken gets into like a bit of a fight with some of the other Kens on the beach. And Ken is like, my only job is to beach. I challenge you to a beach off. I will beach you off every day. 
<laughs> and then like the other Ken's career is like, no, I'll beat you off. If you're gonna beat him off, you're gonna have to beat me off first. It's really funny. The delivery is perfect. It's great. It's like a whole thing on beach and you know, you get like again, it's funny for the adults, but kids aren't really gonna get it. They're just gonna think it's a funny, you know, back and forth between like, ooh, the Kens are bickering, you know, that's what they're gonna see. They're not gonna get the innuendo there. It's fine, you know? But other than that, I have like no issues with it not being a kid's film, you know? There's already so many Barbie films out there for kids. It's nice to have one for adults because Barbie has been around since 1959. Barbie is 64 years old. The majority of people who played with Barbies as kids are now adults and adults are the ones with the spending power. So why wouldn't filmmakers want to tap into that like love of nostalgia and target all of us between the ages of like 18 and 70 instead of just kids. It makes sense from a marketing perspective and personally I loved it. This is exactly the film that I, as an adult Barbie fan, wanted. I uh, was just thinking like, you know, I didn't have this type of propaganda being shoved down my throat when I was younger growing up. Like, I didn't have that and whether that was because like my parents protected me from watching propaganda like that or what i hope they did yeah or it just wasn't being like hardcore created i don't know ah uh, see it uh it's hard to kind of define that line between what's propaganda and what's just an empowering message for people you know but i i wouldn't i wouldn't call this film propaganda at all. I do think if young girls and women watch this and young boys, then it's gonna give them an empowering message. I do think that it's something that they should hear and grow up with, you know? Like, why wouldn't you want your kids to see a film about how you can grow up to be anything you want and how you should treat others with respect and how you need to define purpose and meaning for yourself in your own life? I don't think that's a bad message to be teaching anyone regardless of age. You know, I actually can't wait for my niece to be a few years older to show her the film because I think she's going to love it and appreciate it and get a lot out of it, you know. Um, but the other bit in here about Morgan not seeing feminist messages growing up. Yeah, that explains a lot. And I feel sorry for her. <laughs> um, but like the fact that 10 year olds are watching this and whether it's subconscious or conscious, these thoughts of men are trash, women should be ruling the world if we live in a terrible world because men are in power and women are not, which is not even true now, guys. Well, like, they, they there kept, are a crap ton of women in power they these kept, days. They kept referring to the Supreme Court and yeah. ultimately saying that the Supreme Court in Barbie world needs to be all, it's all women. Yeah. And But it's like, I mean, there's, there's several women on the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Like the stuff but they that's were... That's not good enough. No, again, missing the point of everything... The point was that by the end of the film, Barbies and Kens weren't equally or proportionally represented in their government system, and this wasn't shown to be a good thing, and it's not a good thing in our world either. Again, it's true that there are more women in power today in our world than in the past, but that still doesn't mean we're equal. <sighs> Do I need to pull out more feminist theory? Because I will. According to research compiled by Caroline Credo Perez in her book Invisible Women, bitch was the most common term used in tweets about Australian ex-Prime Minister Julia Gillard, who between 2010 and 2014, who was similarly the target of almost twice as many abusive messages as her political rival Kevin Rudd. One European MP told the IPU that she once received more than 500 rape threats on Twitter over a period of four days. Another quote from Perez, more than one in five female parliamentarians surveyed by the IPU had been subjected to one or more acts of sexual violence, while a third had witnessed sexual violence being committed against a female colleague. During the 2010 elections in Afghanistan, nearly all female candidates received threatening phone calls, and some female MPs in their country required round-the-clock protection. Mary Ann Seijar tells us of how Ségolène Royale was all set to become France's first female president in 2017, but was narrowly defeated, she says, thanks to widespread misogyny. Even men in her own party, the socialists, undermined her. But who's going to look after the children, asked Laurent Fabius, a former prime minister, when she announced her bid for the presidency. 
Other socialists suggested that she was lightweight, erratic, and unintelligent. She was described as a nude dancer, a washing powder advertisement, and super nanny, none of which would be wielded against men. Mike Rann, who is an Australian politician who worked alongside Julia Gillard, who I mentioned earlier, uh, Australia's first female prime minister, said, and I quote, I don't think I've ever seen anyone more denigrated despite her incredible abilities because of her gender. She was diminished because of her clothing, because of her looks, because she wasn't married, and because she didn't have children. And so we saw an attempt by large segments of the media and by her political opponent, opponents to try and to try and delegitimize her as prime minister because of her sex. He goes on, there were constant references to the side of her backside, her clothing, her makeup, her hair, none of the things that we blokes had to put up with. What it showed me is that female politicians can't win. If they don't have children, they're somehow inadequate. If they do, they should be at home looking after them. If they're attractive, they're not serious, they're dolly birds. If they're not attractive, they're also denigrated. For women in politics, not just in Australia, but all over the world, you need a much bigger dose of resilience to put up with this crap. C Sharp also writes, see, I can keep going on and on and on. She writes how in the UK, when Theresa May became conservative leader more than 40 years after Thatcher, she still had to battle a lot of sexism. There was a notorious never mind Brexit who won Legsit front page of the Daily Mail, illustrated by a photo of May and the Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon sitting next to each other with the focus on their two pairs of legs. Inside, a column by Sarah Vine was headlined, finest weapons at their command, those pins. She referred to Sturgeon's legs as altogether more flirty, tantalizingly crossed, a direct attempt at seduction. So no, Paul, it's really not enough that there's like several women in politics because it's really not enough when they're treated like this, is it? There's so much discrimination and hate and harassment that just, well, they're there isn't enough when they're not treated fairly. I could go on and on and on. These are just a mere handful of examples. <laughs> and then there's literally, at the end of the movie, it's like, okay, we've just, you know, ana anatomy, an autonomy, autonomy. The autonomy is back, it's ours again. We have all women on, on the Supreme Court. And then one of the kins is like, can we just have one single man on the Supreme Court? And she says, nope, but you can have a lower place. And he's like, that'll work. Can I wear a robe? <laughs> it's, it, <laughs> it like giggles off screen. <laughs> Again, it, it was so... It's so degrading Absurdly <laughs> degrading and political. Yeah, so that was frustrating. Yeah, because that's how women historically have been treated. It was a comment on that. They treated Ken the way women have been treated. They had Ken respond how men seem to think that women will respond to being thrown the crumbs. If you can see this as degrading, why can't you see that the way you treat women is degrading? This is so frustrating. How are they missing the point this badly? How, girls? You get it and your dolls. When a plastic doll has more brains than Paul and Morgan. Really says something, doesn't it? It almost feels like she's like, Greta Gerwig dug her own grave. And granted, like, it's crushing it in the box office. Will it have a major sharp but decline? I think that's because a lot of people going probably don't have any idea that it's this, like, woke and political. I actually, there were two girls walking out and I heard them talking. And one of the girls was like, did you know it was going to be like that? And one, the other girl was like, what? Like, what? And she was like, so, like down on men and the girl's like no i had no idea yeah i feel like it it, it could have been so much of a just like um, literally I, i'm a, kind of thinking it's gonna drop off because it, it was so political like it's not a fun movie for men no or women in my personal opinion it wasn't fun so for I, me i don't to think watch. it's gonna make it in the long run the longevity the bringing in the money well it's just made over a billion dollars so i'm gonna say it's all good you know and that is without all the Barbie merch, the clothing collabs, the makeup collabs, the dolls, everything. Look, I'm I'm not a fan of hoarding wealth. I'm not a fan of big companies making even more billions of dollars. But you can't pretend that this film hasn't made a crap ton of money and is a commercial success. And it is loved by the majority of audiences. It has so many positive reviews. I know plenty of people who have been to see it more than once. If I wasn't so busy with work and life and everything, 
I would be tempted to go back and watch it again too, but I'm gonna wait until it comes out on DVD or streaming or something first, because I am so excited to watch it again. Uh, um, there was, you know, the classic, uh, <clears throat> oh, Little Man is Awake. There was the classic trans Barbie that, uh, you know, it, it felt like I was watching, uh, what's, uh, Dylan, Dylan Mulvaney. Dylan Mulvaney up there. Yes. Uh, as a Barbie. Yes. That, that, that could have been even more explicit. Like, there could have been just a ton of that. Like, you're watching a Taylor Swift music video. Mm -hmm. a, a modern day Taylor Swift <laughs> yeah. music video. But, yeah. but there was. Uh, just, just FYI. Great. More transphobia. What does that even mean? What the hell is the classic trans Barbie? It... Mm -hmm. No, it wasn't a trans Barbie, it was a Doctor Barbie, who was a doctor who did doctor things that just happened to be played by a really talented trans actress. That is it. Now the thing is, Barbie have made dolls of trans women. One of my favourite dolls, you'll see here, I have this beautiful collector's edition of the Laverne Cox tribute doll. She is stunning, she is wearing this beautiful red leather bodice with this like glittery silver bodysuit underneath. This doll is one of the most stunning things I've ever seen and Laverne Cox is wonderful, you know. But that's the thing about Barbie. Barbie is about representing all women and little girls and that includes trans women and girls. Why shouldn't it? We're all women together and we all deserve representation. We all deserve to see beautiful dolls that look like ourselves, that represent ourselves, that are aspirational versions of who we want to be and who we can be. Barbie has always been an icon for women and that includes all women. So just shut up, Paul. Shut up. You're an idiot. Well, let me just say one more thing. And this is something that I mentioned to my friend Carl and... She was kind of like, oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> or just like, was like, ah, oh, I didn't really think about that. Or I think this was one of them. But I just really thought that the fact that one of the main characters in the real world is a middle school girl, middle school aged girl who Barbie thought was the girl who was like playing with her in the real world, which was like causing Barbie to have issues in Barbie world, whatever. Um, and so she went to find her and like make her happy again. And this middle school girl was probably like 12 years old and she was so rude, so mean. Oh, so bitter. So sad. Barbie came up to her and was like all excited to meet her and was like, tell me about your life. And like all of her little friends were like, yeah, go off on her, Barbie. Tell her how to destroy her. That was one thing that they said. And this girl like goes off and it's like. On just the classic. Fascist and sexist and it's your fault. You've ruined women, Barbie, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, this is just disgusting, first of all. For 12 year olds, for them to like make this the main character be like a 12 year old little girl and to give her, like, I just am tired of the like bratty teenage, not even teen, preteen girl. And like, she didn't have a rough life growing up. It was clear that she had a mother and a father who they barely, barely showed the father in the picture. Granted, they made her mother, who was America Ferrara look like total doofus among us. I, I literally forgot that there was a father. I, I thought they were like making it where <laughs> Yeah, she was like she like was a, a single mom. Yes, or something. Uh, really Yeah, no, turns out she's got a dad too and loves yeah, him. Desperate like, single mom. So weird. So I just did not like that. I didn't like that they like just had this twelve year old be whatever. So savage. And I didn't like that throughout the whole movie when her and her mom show up into the movie like she is mothering the mom she is mothering america america is not the mom figure she's like this scaredy cat lame weak woman who doesn't know how to daughter how to mother her daughter her daughter is telling her to step it up and like it's just sad to me okay again what god there's so much to unpack here okay one, the kid wasn't the main character. I, where did you get that from? Two, the kid actually had some really good points about the way Barbie dolls were made and marketed in the past and how they very could easily have been and still be a bad influence on girls today. Three, the kid did come around in the end of the film to understand the appeal of Barbie in the end. So 
if you give me a second in a minute, I'll give you a very brief and abridged lesson on the famous history of Barbie. We'll get to that in a second. But first, four, there was no mothering the mother. There was no parentification. It was just a mother-daughter journey together, learning and growing and becoming closer in the process. And it was lovely. I'm not sure we watched the same film, you know? But yeah, let's talk about the kids' rant in the film because it was a good one, you know? Okay, so when... Barbie and the kid Sasha first meet. Sasha tells her, you're like a professional bimbo. Playing with Barbies was awful. You've been making women feel bad about themselves since you were invented. You represent sexualized capitalism and so on. And yeah, she had some really good points and I really respect the film for bringing them up and addressing them. Look, I'm a big nerd when it comes to Barbie, as I am with most things in my life, and I am really interested in the history of Barbie and the dolls and everything like that. One of my happiest childhood memories was actually when my mum took me to this exhibit for the 40th anniversary of Barbie, and I got to see a whole bunch of dolls from like the last 40 years, arranged in chronological order with like information about their history and everything, and I think I was like six years old at the time, and it still sticks out to me as one of these like amazing wonderful memories because it was just so magical and I loved it. Um, that, oh, also, that's the only time I've ever seen one of the original Barbie dolls in person and, you know, the first ever doll with a black and white swimsuit and, oh my god, she was stunning. I love that doll. I love it so much. One of my biggest regrets was, I think it was for the 50th anniversary, they did a re-release of that doll, a special edition, a collector's edition, and I wanted her so badly, but I just, like, I was very poor at the time and I had no spare money and I couldn't get her and oh, it's still one of my biggest regrets today that I don't have her because she was gorgeous. Oh, I want. Anyway, like I said earlier, let's talk about the feminist history of Barbie. Barbie has been around since 1959 and it has been a journey since. Just like with any real person, the brand of Barbie, the doll, the idea of Barbie has been a journey with ups and downs and you know, it has grown and learned along the way and it's made mistakes too. That's completely understandable. Barbie, when she was first introduced, was revolutionary. The first doll was this absolutely stunning woman with, you know, thick eyeliner and a beautiful black and white swimsuit, gorgeous curves, heels, sunglasses, curly strawberry blonde hair. She was glamorous, she was confident, she was powerful, she was beautiful, she was aspirational. And Barbie continued to be aspirational. Into the 60s, you had Barbies with these amazing jobs, like being astronauts. It was brilliant. It told young girls who were playing with her that you can be whoever you want to be. And soon we started seeing all kinds of Barbie dolls of different races with all kinds of styles. And it was really, really cool. But there was a problem that became apparent as time went on they were using the exact same mold for every doll, the exact same somewhat unrealistic body type, the same basic look for every doll. There were also a few other problematic elements too. For example, in 1965, Slumber Party Barbie, who I've spoken about in a short on my channel before, uh, she came with a set of weighing scales permanently set to 110 pounds and a book on how to lose weight. In the mid 70s, you had Growing Up Skipper, who was an attempt to teach kids about puberty by being a doll who grew taller and developed breasts when you rotated her arm. You know, they were trying to do something good, but it wildly missed the mark. There was also the mass media response to Barbie, which sexualized her and created a whole culture who saw her as nothing but, and I quote, a dumb bimbo. Even the iconic Aqua song Barbie Girl features lyrics like, you can brush my hair, undress me everywhere, and I'm a blonde bimbo girl in a fantasy world. Dress me up, make it tight, I'm your dolly. So yeah, Sasha's criticisms in the film had some validity to them, they really did, but I think it's great that Mattel realised this and started to make changes. Barbie dolls now come in all sorts of shapes, sizes, styles. You have dolls of different heights, weights, races, abilities, dolls representing amazing women from history. Seriously, I really want the Maya Angelou doll next. Oh, she's gorgeous and you know I love my poets. Amazing. The point is they really took steps to make sure that Barbie was represented properly as the feminist icon and inspiration for women and girls that she was always meant to be. They made some mistakes along the way, but the goal was always to inspire women and make them feel strong and confident and empowered. 
I think it's understandable that the brand missed the mark sometimes. Even with good intentions, people get things wrong. That's completely normal. And in a 64 year history, people are gonna make mistakes. It's absolutely understandable. I think the important thing is to recognize that those were mistakes and understand the steps that Bobby as a brand took to make things better, which they've repeatedly done. So I think Sasha's role in this film was representing that and, you know, Mattel saying, hey, we recognize these problems, we recognize these issues, and here's what we've done and are doing to correct it and make it better. And I think it's really important that they put that in. I think it was really well done. And I don't understand what Morgan was so upset about. I don't. And I'm like- But that could be the reality. Of well, the, sometimes I mean you see that a good amount with bratty daughters and mothers that just take the submissive role but that just makes me be like quit your job lady and go learn how to raise your daughter because that is your main job but no they trashed motherhood multiple times and being a mother is very ordinary and not special even and though at one point they do cool they do it. bring it back and say that you can be a mother like right it was In one her very long speech she quickly says if you want to be a mother that's fine or if you don't want to be a mother that's fine too that was her <laughs> phrase <laughs> <laughs> not good enough for me wait what like, n no, Gloria was a great mother and she was great at her job and none of that was the point of the film. And that one line in Gloria's speech was like the climax and the highlight of that entire movie. It was amazing and she was right. She goes on this huge, brilliant monologue about the difficulties be of being a woman and it's great. And she makes the very, very valid point of if you want to be a mother, it is fine. If you don't, it is fine too. Why are you mocking that, Morgan, when it is literally true? Nothing's ever good enough for Morgan, is it? Just like grow up, you petulant child. Like I've made so many videos on Paul and Morgan at this point and watched and read so much of their content that I just have no patience for them anymore. Like I really don't. I don't like them as people. I think there is so much wrong with them and I'm not afraid to say it anymore. I'm really not. Anyway, sorry. So we're leaving the theater and I turn to Morgan and I say, all right, your official one through 10 score. And I'm thinking we're gonna drop very similar scores <laughs> at the end of the day, but that was not the case. And Morgan has actually in the last day said her score even dropped another point. Yeah. So when we first walked out of the theater, I gave it. We said three, two, one. Four she out gave of 10. a four out of 10. I gave it a seven and a half out of 10. Now it's a three out of 10 for me. The longer I think on it. Hers has dropped and I will go down to a seven out of 10. <laughs> This surprised me, like 7 out of 10 is quite a high score. How can you give a film 7 out of 10 and be complaining this much? I just, I don't understand their rating system. I don't trust it. I don't trust them. I just, God's sake, okay. I wanted to leave that movie feeling fun and lighthearted. I left annoyed that I spent money on that and wasted two and a half hours of my life. That's fair. I mean, that is fair. <laughs> okay, I don't think the film was that long, isn't it like? just under two hours like an hour 50 or something like that I don't know like look I'm sorry you felt that way honestly I felt similarly after reading Paul and Morgan's book like I just wasted so much of my life but no when I saw Barbie I left the cinema feeling like I had a wonderful evening and had absolutely no regrets it's great loved it brilliant and that's where their video ends thankfully oh my god okay I'm exhausted that's where I am also gonna end things today. So thank you all so much for watching this video. I also wanna extend a little thank you to everyone who is supporting me over on Patreon because without you guys, I wouldn't be able to keep making videos like this. Uh, your help is invaluable and I appreciate it so much. So thank you. If you wanna support my channel in other ways, I've just got a whole bunch of new merch designs uh, that are now available over on my merch store. I'm gonna have some cool promo images released soon of me wearing them and stuff, which is exciting. Um, I'm just waiting for a couple of extra samples to arrive and then I can post them all together and everything. It's gonna be great. Um, so if you wanna check them out, you can do. Everything is designed by me, which is really fun and I love it. And I have this really cool section of, um, I've done like an abstract painting all over print t-shirt before, but now I've done a couple of new designs and one of them in particular, the yellow one, I've also released as like, um, not only like t-shirts, but also as a sports bra and little like bike shorts you can get because I was very heavily inspired by the roller skating Barbie and Ken outfits in the Barbie film and the dolls that they were based on. So um, little 
you know, if you're a Barbie fan, you might want to check out those designs for yourself. They're also available as t-shirts and stuff like that as well, so all of the good stuff. Anyway, right, um, I'm rambling at this point, I'm so bad at self-promotion. If you're new here, it would be wonderful if you subscribed. Uh, please leave a comment if you liked the video or if you didn't, because it really, really helps with engagement. Don't forget to leave a like too. And I think that's everything. Yes, wonderful. Kubi's finally settled down, but I think I'm gonna take her for one last walk so she can get all that energy out. And uh, yeah, be just your walkies. Yeah, little waggy tail. Yes, that's such a good girl. All right, thank you so much for watching today. Thank you for your patience with Kubi being a little bit crackly. Uh, thank you for joining me. I hope you learned something along the way. I can't wait to hear your thoughts and I will see you all again soon. Bye.